you hear that? Welcome to Montana. Would you like to learn more about wolves? This way. Hi, welcome to the Science of Wolves. I'm Jay Maloney, and I'm a research biologist in Northwest Montana. And I've been studying wild wolves now for a little over 30 years throughout the United States, but mostly in Montana. In fact, the wolves you just heard are members of the pack I'm currently studying. This is the first of hopefully many videos that will view wolves from a scientific perspective. And this particular video is an introduction so that you know what to expect in the future, who I am, and how each video is planned out. I also have a nonprofit called Wolf and Wildlife Studies. It encompasses my research, publishing these studies, along with magazine articles, and educating the public about wolves and the environment. I've also partnered with the Colorado Wolf and Wildlife Center to help produce these videos, and we share many of the same goals. One of these is to help dispel the misinformation about wolves. In fact, there's a lot of it. So the science of wolves will present the facts about these animals and how they actually live in the environment. Not hearsay, not rumors, not tradition, where granddad describes how he was stalked and almost killed by a wolf pack when he was out hunting. Similar claims are occasionally made here in Montana, and of course, they're ridiculous. For example, the local news reported in the past, the two hunters claimed that they were being harassed and surrounded by wolves. So the, as they made their escape, the two hunters walked back to back with their rifles pointed outwards, and they circled as they walked so that they were leaving the forest constantly looking 360 degrees. Much of the public, including serious hunters, thought their story was ludicrous, and they said so. However, this is just the kind of information that often feeds into people's violent perception of wolves and promotes fear of these animals. Also, wolves do not kill hundreds of ranchers' cows a year. They also don't wipe out the deer or elk populations. And they certainly don't come into people's homes and steal your kids. This was a concern among some locals in another state where I used to live. So there are all sorts of strange ideas associated with wolves. However, to get the actual facts, we'll go over the scientific information about wolves in the future. And we'll review a variety of topics to see what wolves really are. For example, how wolves perceive the world using their senses. How their senses differ from ours. And what happens when a wolf from the wild is placed into captivity, which can result in post-traumatic stress disorder. This is one of my research studies in the past, so we'll take a look at that in the future videos. Also, we'll look at how wolf packs are organized, such as their social hierarchy and so on. Then there are interactions among pack members. In other words, pack dynamics, which is what I currently study. We'll also look at how the wolf's presence produces a powerful positive impact on the surrounding environment. This is known as trophic cascading, and it's a process that science is learning more and more about. So we're definitely going to go over that. We'll also look at how wolf packs in the same region interact with one another. And this is important because it leads to how wolves are managed by the state and how all that came about. Management, of course, is not without some major controversies, which often leads to the death of the wolves. We will definitely be reviewing that in the future. We'll explore these and other topics and see how they're all related so that we can view wolves more accurately and see how they really exist in the world. We'll do this over a period of time and in a way that makes sense because learning about some topics is going to depend on reviewing other ones first. Ultimately, however, to know about wolves, you kind of have to think like one. For example, this can be something as simple as how they move through the environment. Humans walk on two limbs, of course. Wolves use four. This keeps them much lower to the ground where they can more easily take in scents and view the surroundings in a way that we don't. 
This difference alone can create huge changes in perspective. Therefore, even though we walk through the same environment, they're taking in different information and coming to different conclusions. So how will these videos be organized? There'll be a new video each month and it will be posted on the Colorado Wolf and Wildlife Center's YouTube account and on their Facebook account. And I'm going to pick a new topic to review for each month. And then you can ask questions about that month's topic by posting them on the Colorado uh, Wolf and Wildlife Center's Facebook page. After that, I'll answer several of them in the next video. Overall, we're going to need to start our journey with wolves with the basics and work our way closer and closer to what a wolf really is. But that's next time. In the meantime, you'll need to know some of my background so that you know that I'm not just saying things that are purely my opinion. What I'll present in the future is based in science, and if I don't know something or if science doesn't know, I'll tell you that. However, as a quick review, my master's degree is in neurobiology meaning I did brain research and I've been studying animal behavior ever since. I originally began with cetaceans, which are whales, dolphins, and porpoises. I studied them in the wild for 20 years, but this finally led to the study of wolves. There was an overlap of studying these two groups of uh, animals for a number of years, because I'm not that old, uh, and eventually I chose wolves. 30 years later, here I am. It has been an extensive and often intense journey, as you'll see in future videos. And when it comes to wolves, science certainly doesn't know everything about them. In fact, most research has been done in national parks, where for the most part, wolves are protected. However, the majority of wolves in the U.S. live in national forests, where they're not protected, and they have to deal with the extraordinary circumstances that we oppose upon them, like hunting, snaring, trapping, and that's for six months out of the year here in Montana. Therefore, the behavior seen in wolves inside national parks doesn't necessarily translate to the same behavior seen in wolves outside the parks. And we'll go over some of this uh, in the future. Except for the study of a wild wolf placed into captivity, my research has always been conducted in national forests, which has often put me in direct conflict with the state wolf management agency over the years. I want to study these animals, and they want to kill it. A great example of that is the fish trap pack that I studied for nine years in northwest Montana. The howls you hear are from them. In the end, they were killed by the state government for apparently killing someone's cow. In this case, all pack members were killed, including pups. I just woke up one day and they were gone. This ended the longest behavioral study of wolves in Montana's history outside of Yellowstone National Park. This is the simplest version of what happened and other factors were involved. But science was not, and still isn't, a priority to these people. Although I was visited by one of their biologists who made several attempts to coerce me to give him all of my data, which I did not. Regardless, I mention all this because I don't have much control over the outcome of these animals' lives. Which means, at least for now, I must be extremely careful with the information of my current project. As you'll see, I even named the project in reference to what has happened in the past. Currently, the hunting of wolves is more extensive than ever and involves a bow season, a rifle season, and a trapping season. It's six months in all, and the wolves in Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming, uh, they're pounded on for most of the year, especially if you include poaching. Therefore, wolves don't really live long enough in Montana to study long term, at least behaviorally. Even years ago, one of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service biologists stated that wolves live three to four years, then they're killed in some way by people. I don't know of any data to support that, but it's an interesting observation, nonetheless. Uh, regardless, it takes many years to study even one pack, and now I have to be extremely cautious when I do so. The irony, then, is that I can't tell you much about the current pack. Wolf haters and the government will no doubt be watching these videos as well. However, I live in the northwest corner of the state where it's still fairly, quote, wild, although extensive hunting occurs here as well. But there are some areas where the wolves could possibly retreat to that offer fewer effects from people. Finding these areas, if they exist, is part of my study. 
In effect, where I live is one of the few places in the National Forest where wolves can literally make their last stand, so to speak. In reference to this, I named my current study Skyfall Wolf Research. The name Skyfall is in reference to the James Bond movie of the same name, but different spelling. Its meaning is a good moniker for the wolves situation and my research in Montana. And warning, this is a spoiler alert, although the movie came out 14 years ago, sorry about that. Bond spends most of the movie attempting to protect his boss and mentor from being murdered by a terrorist. He eventually kidnaps her and they drive to the isolated area in Scotland where he grew up. His family land was named Skyfall and it now becomes a bastion to make their final stand, much like a wolf pack's territory, which is defended at almost all costs. However, Bond fails. She's killed before he can eliminate the threat, although he does successfully eliminate it. I found the wolf's skyfall, and the same dilemma is present here. Similar to the movie, there is currently no way to stop the unrelenting, compassionless force that will end the many lives of wolves annually throughout the state via hunting control actions and poaching. And there's no guarantee I will be able to complete my study of this pack before they're killed, as I learned from the fish trap pack. The point of telling you all this is that I'm always going to tell you the truth, at least as best as science knows it, and I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. However, I'm not here to produce depression or helplessness. In fact, there's a great deal you can do to help these animals. However, to do so, you have to understand uh, the grim reality that human beings perpetuate onto wolves and other wildlife. Many field biologists like myself have to put up with this kind of scenario so we often live immersed in our surroundings and enjoy the feeling of contentment that it gives us. It provides our centeredness and we find humor wherever we can. But for the most part, you'll be learning about wolves in general, which involves some fascinating topics. But to fully understand the life of wolves means learning how they're affected by all environmental factors, and that includes us. Our presence is felt in many ways, either indirectly from habitat modification or destruction, to direct effects, like being shot and killed. People are a consistent force that wolves must contend with. Uh-oh, the elk are vocalizing. That means it's time to answer some questions. I need to do something first, so I'll be right back. Okay, before I uh, answer the question that I received, I just want to remind everybody that these videos will be posted on the last Thursday of the month and on the Colorado Wolf and Wildlife Center's Facebook page and on their YouTube account. And to submit questions, you'll need to post them on their Facebook account or their Facebook page. Also, it's recommended that you watch these videos in something larger than a phone screen. Otherwise, otherwise, you're going to be unable to follow some of the processes used to explain information about wolves. So, something to keep in mind. And as for the question, someone asked me about the alpha wolves in a pack. And they stated, the term alpha is often associated with wolf packs. Do packs actually have alphas? And the answer is, kind of. The term alpha is outdated these days and really hasn't been used by wolf biologists and scientists since the mid-2000s. And the term alpha was coined by David Meech in the 60s and 70s. He is the most famous and accomplished of all the wolf biologists. And the term was promoted in a book he published in 1970. And this is the book. <laughs> and it's The Wolf, The Ecology and Behavior of an Endangered Species. He originally used the most current science at the time, which involved captive packs. In captivity, however, wolves can become more competitive, and to the point where it appears as if, as if there are strict social hierarchies that guide and shape wolf packs, and that there are actually one or two true leaders, meaning the alphas. In this scenario, they fought to stay on top, socially speaking, 
In the wild, however, as Meech and other scientists learn, they understood that this is not really the case. Wolf packs are simply family units, like a human family, uh, consisting of parents and their offspring. As the mature wolves in the group, the parents were labeled the alphas, but they didn't fight to get there. Socially, they were on top by default because they were the parents, not because there was a physical battle to achieve that position. We'll go over pack structure in future videos, but in general, a wolf pack consists of the parents and their offspring. By two years old or so, some of the offspring might disperse and leave the pack to find a mate and form a pack of their own. Those offspring that stay behind then become the older siblings of the next litter of pups the following year, assuming the pack has another litter. In the wild, there doesn't seem to be much ensuing battle for social position within the pack other than some minor disagreements, and the pack as a whole remains relatively devoid of conflict. In Yellowstone National Park, however, this is not always true, but we'll deal with that in another video. Nevertheless, packs do fight other packs for a variety of reasons, but within their own group, not really. However, individuals may demonstrate leadership in a variety of ways, for example, when hunting or when traveling and helping to ensure the group gets from one place to another efficiently. I've ID'd two individuals in the pack I currently study who do exactly that. And I'm also not seeing any conflict upon, among pack members. As Meech and other scientists learned more and more about uh, wolf pack structure over the years, he began to discourage the use of the term alpha because it wasn't accurate. Although it had been uh, a good place to start because at the time, Wolf, wild wolf packs were barely studied. So this is a good demonstration of how uh, science works and how it progresses. For example, when additional and more updated information becomes available, the overall conclusions are modified. Uh, in the meantime, the alpha term has taken root in our culture and it's been used in a variety of ways to demonstrate some kind of dominance over somebody else. Apparently, however, that doesn't fully apply to wolves. If you're interested, you can listen to and watch Meech himself explain online how the term alpha began and why he understands now that it wasn't accurate. Although in the context of that time period, it had made sense. So, thank you for watching uh, the first installment of The Science of Wolves, and I'll see you in a few weeks. <laughs>